Hey creepy people, this is P&W Haunts and Homicides. I'm Caitlin. And I'm Cassie. Together we explore stories of the paranormal and true crime throughout the Pacific Northwest. We're just two normal-ish friends who wanted more creepy local stories. Our episodes start with a tarot reading to help us gain some insight on each topic as we share the facts of the case and our interpretations. Come join us. We've got plenty of wine, laughs, and stories to share. You can find our episodes featuring true stories from infamous as well as lesser-known true crime cases like the murders in Tunnel 13 and Forest Park. As well as our spooky stories from Pike Place in the Oregon Vortex on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and many more. For all of you that are listening, if you have any true crime or paranormal stories that you want us to share, email us at pnwhauntsandhomicides at gmail.com. Have Have a a creepy creepy ass ass day. day! On this episode of Common Mystics, we bring you the tale of the dramatic demise of a celebrated American whom you know nothing about. I'm Jennifer James. I'm Jill Stanley. We're psychics. We're sisters. We are Common Mystics. We find extraordinary stories in ordinary places, and today's story is about a massacre in the Utah Territory. I'm so excited for this one. Mm. Jen, can you tell everyone why we were in Utah? We were at our nephew's wedding. Yay! Yay! AJ was wedded to Allison, whom we love. She's adorable. Mm -hmm. So we took the opportunity to look around in the area while we were in Utah. Why not? Why not? Can you set the intention and remind everyone what we do? What we do is we set an intention to find a verifiable story that we previously knew nothing about, but most importantly, to give voice to the voiceless. That's right. And so we leave our hotel in Salt Lake City and we start heading west. And this is a little unique because Jennifer's driving. I'm trusting her with my life and she's not. (laughs) Hey, I only almost killed us once. That's really true. Mm -hmm. That's a story for another day. (laughs) So we headed west out of the city and then we turned south on 36 and we were traveling through the county of Thule. Mm -hmm. That's right. And right away, when we were in that area, we were getting hits. Well, the thing about it is the Mormons are everywhere. If you're in Salt Lake City, you can't get away from the Mormons and the Church of Latter-day Saints because they literally built the city. And we discussed several times that we're feeling Mormon, obviously, Obviously. but But we didn't want to discuss. We did not want to discuss a powerful church. So we didn't know how this was going to go. And we actually sat on this story for like a year because we did not want to talk about the Mormons. That's true. That's true. And here we are. And here we are. (laughs) Yeah. So as we were driving around, we kept feeling like things weren't what they seemed to be. Like that seemed to be a feeling that both of us were getting. Like things under the surface, things hidden. I was also getting like... In that same vein, Stepford Wives, like Mm. everyone seemed to be uniform in a way, but it was seen more like people were forced into submission or conformity Mm. rather than genuinely a part of a community. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it makes sense more later after research. Mm hmm. Um, Also, the idea of changing community, like a people in, a people out. Do you know what I mean? Like that idea of transiency, moving communities. That's right. And you were also feeling in that same vein, in that same way, a land grab Mm -hmm. as if as the changing of communities were happening, people were like, this is mine now. (laughs) Right. Like you got up. (laughs) Right. Exactly. 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 Also, both of us were talking about that feeling of being under attack, being ambushed. Right. It felt as if we were being watched mm-hmm. and observed. Uh-huh. So much so that Jennifer, who was driving, stopped at a gas station right before what seemed to be us heading into like the open desert. Mm-hmm. 
and we needed gas. Mm-hmm. And Jen gets out of the car. I'm sitting in the passenger sh- seat, and I'm like, oh, I have such a bad feeling. And then right away, what happened? I didn't even get gas. I got right back into the car, and I was like, nope, 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 nope. And we just drove away. Like, we were going to take our chances in the desert on empty rather than stay at that gas station. It was very bizarre. It, it was, and, and ridiculous. Logically, the- that makes no sense. The people in the community or the 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 county that we were driving through, Tule County, they're lovely people. We got Starbucks, we interacted, it, but for some reason, it felt like we were we were sitting ducks. We were being yeah observed yeah. And, and under attack. It totally felt that way. Another thing that comes up again and again on our stories, and this one in particular, was the railroad. Absolutely. Jill, what does railroad energy feel like to you? In my mind's eye, t- I see Thomas the train. <laughs> really? How cute. Yeah, I yeah, I see Thomas and that's how I know. And then it when and that comes with a um a certain feeling of an era, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So like when we were in Sycamore, Illinois, I was feeling um westerny kind of vibe. Mm-hmm. So I will get Thomas and then the feeling of like what time in history are we focusing on? I can hear the noise of a, of an oh. old train going by and I just it's like when you when you look out the window and you see something go by really fast like that's the kind of energy I feel so like the the sound of the train that was happening and we knew that for some reason the train the railroad was a part of this story it comes up again and again. So after a while you get so familiar with your signs. Right. What else were you picking up on? Mining, specifically the idea of digging in the earth and taking out rocks of value. And what I was feeling really strongly is that I had to dig into the history of this county. Mm. That's something I would find significant to our story within the history of the county. So I was anxious to get back to the hotel and start doing the research. And you took the lead on the research on this one. Yes, very right. true. And it turns out you would be right. Can you tell me a little bit about Tule County? Absolutely. Tule County is in the current state of Utah, but back in the 1850s, it was part of the Utah Territory, which, by the way, was a massive territory that included parts of western Colorado through the modern-day western edge of Nevada. Okay. Okay. Now, the Mormons settled the area in 1847. They settled around the Great Salt Lake and creating conflicts with the natives that were already living there. I mean, this is another thing we see again and again in American history. And here it it happened again in the Utah Territory. Right. Mm -hmm. So, of course, fighting ensued between the natives, who you don't even blame anymore, right, with with the white people coming in. And uh, more conflicts would occur throughout the 1850s uh, with the native people. I just want to go on record and say I never blamed the natives. I still don't. (laughs) Tecumseh is like, who would blame the natives? They're just minding their business. Okay, go on. Sorry. No, that's okay. So anyway, I mean, and the natives were obviously on the losing side of those battles, you know, being forced out of their land. So again, it's the tale as old as time, but here it is again. So tell me about the Mormons, okay? Because I thought that they were from, well, at least the little bit I know about Mormonism is Mitt Romney, and I thought... God spoke to someone in New York. That's what I thought. Oh, okay. You're right. God did speak to someone in New York. I knew it. (laughs) The Mormons are, uh, or the Latter-day Saints, are a Christian religion, and it embraces the revelations made by their founder, Joseph Smith, who was from upstate New York and who uh, wrote the Book of Mormon, which was published in 1830. Oh, my gosh. That's a play. I knew something else. I haven't seen it, have you? No, but I hear good things. Okay, I haven't seen it. I'd like to, but um, Joseph Smith received 100 messages from Jesus himself. Jesus was awfully chatty to Joseph Smith. Apparently he was. He had chemistry with him, I guess. (laughs) Can I just say one thing, though, about Hmm. Joseph Smith? Huh? He has the most unremarkable name, and it's a shame. 
No, really. You know what? Really? I honestly, that that's rude because my name is very unremarkable too. Well, hold on a second. Yes, but he was a big deal. Like he like founded a religion and throughout time, there are a lot of people who reinvent themselves, take on a new name when God comes to them, right? So I'm just saying it was a missed opportunity. He could have some, gone with something a little fancier and more distinctive than Joseph Smith. That's all I'm going to say about that. I think you're probably feeling that way because the successor to Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, that's a great that name. is a great name. That one's just fun to say. It is. It is a really great name. It sounds like a designer. It does. Who are you wearing? Brigham Young. Ooh. Brigham Young jeans. <laughs> Find them at Macy's. Okay, back to Joseph Smith and his plain name. His revelations that he got from Jesus happened between 1825 and 1835 while he was establishing his religion. And uh, here's something interesting, because you got to figure he's getting messages from Jesus. It would be important to write that shit down, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right. I don't want to miss anything Jesus is telling me. And apparently he was really like he had Jesus on the line a lot, right? Right. 100 messages. Exactly. So one of the sacred duties of the whole religion of the Latter-day Saints is actually record keeping. Isn't that Mm. interesting? Well, it makes Moses look like a slacker because he had like the Ten (laughs) Commandments. You know what I mean? On a rock. Um, According to. Joseph Smith was an overachiever. According to an elder of the church, Stephen E. Snow, he wrote, we keep the records because of the Lord's commandments and we use them to support the church's work of salvation and to help the saints remember. Records help us see and understand the hand of God and his dealings in our lives. So like record keeping, big deal. For the Mormons. Huge deal. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, when I was going through our own genealogy, I the one of the foremost centers for the records of all peoples are in Salt Lake City. Isn't that interesting? Yep. Wow. It's true. And I think they have their own Ancestry.com. I know oh. that that's a thing. Wow. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I just occurred to me and I looked up a little bit is the role of record keeping in history because the people who kept records literally created the history I see that you see where I'm going with this I yes as opposed to like if you think of Native Americans they didn't have a lot of written records their history and information was was passed down orally exactly so just something to keep in mind as we're looking at the conflicts of people the record keepers are the ones who create literally create the history to be passed down I like that yeah good great okay so Joseph Smith yeah so he's like, everyone, get out your notebooks. We're taking notes. We're keeping record. <laughs> right. Then what happened? Well, so you know how I said he was from upstate New York? Mm-hmm. Well, he moved a couple times and ended up in 1839. Uh, the Mormons had a settlement. He bought a, They bought a bunch of land, and they settled in Nauvoo, Illinois. Okay, what brought them from New York to Illinois? Why were they moving so much? My understanding is they were two things, trying to escape persecution, but also try to create a Zion, a place where they could live the way they wanted to live. So I think that was the the purpose of them moving is my okay. understanding. So now they're in Illinois. They didn't so- like it? Well, what there was some conflict there between the Mormon people who were living there, the Mormon community, and the outsiders, right? What happened was in 1844, Joseph Smith ordered the destruction of a non-Mormon newspaper located in Nauvoo, Illinois. What a surprising rebel rouser this guy is. He's like, burn down the newspaper. Anyway, so he ordered a destruction of a non-Mormon newspaper in Nauvoo. It was a big thing. He and his brother were charged with inciting a riot. Sure. Um, they, they surrendered, though. They, they surrendered to the authorities. They were in jail in Carthage when they were attacked and killed by an angry mob. Yeah. No. He was attacked and killed he by and his an brother, angry mob? Yes, while they were in jail. It was, yeah. <gasps> I know. It's a pretty tragic end. That's crazy. It is crazy. So that's when Brigham Young steps Mm. up and he becomes the new leader. Mm -hmm. Now there's a name for you, Brigham Young. 
Mm-hmm. He becomes the second president of the Church of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, after Smith's murder. He actually would rise to become the first governor of the state of Utah. Okay. So Brigham Young was the one that took the party west into yes. the Utah Territory. Yes, exactly. Because um, after that incident in Nauvoo and, or in Illinois. Sure, I would want to get out of town. I ain't taking any chances. So Brigham Young moved the entire community out of Illinois and into the Utah Territory, which, by the way, at the time was not part of the United States of America. Really? Yes. It was actually part of Mexico in 1847. Like, he literally left the country to form his community. Wow. Can I just say something about Mexico here? Hmm. Okay. So if you look at a modern-day map, stay with me. If you look at a modern-day map of, of Mexico, well, of the northern, northwestern hemisphere, Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico kind of looks like the mermaid tail of the United States. Can you see that? <laughs> Hold on, I'm looking at a map. <laughs> yes. Just trust yes. me. You don't have to actually like look. Okay, so back in 1846, 1847, Mexico wasn't just the mermaid tail. It was the whole backside and underbelly of what is now the United States. Did it go all the way up through Canada? Not to Canada. It went to California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. Like, that was all part of the Mexican territory. That was Mexico, yo. That was uh -oh. Mexico. And it wasn't until the end of the Mexican-American War where those territories were then you know, taken by the United States. But when Brigham moved his people in, that was Mexico. He left the country. Wow. Mm -hmm. Interesting, no? That is interesting. And so the the president of the United States at the time was like, since you're there, Brigham Young, you can be the governor. Exactly. Right. You're an American. I'm an American. How about you take control? Because actually nobody else wants to be there right now. <laughs> So what were they doing in the Utah Territory? Well, over the next few decades, there would be thousands more would join the church and move there. You know what? That's so true. We were walking around some of the cemeteries in the area, mm -hmm. and we were noticing that so many immigrants came to this this country or this area to be a part of the Latter-day Saints. That's exactly right. And I believe that churches were established around the world, and then the converts came to Salt Lake City area. Wow. Very yeah, cool. I know. So Brigham Young really kind of styled himself into another great prophet, the same way Joseph Smith was is considered a great prophet. So is Brigham Young. So I want to tell you something. Tell me. Is it about Brigham Young? It is about Brigham Young. Ooh. When I was doing the research for in the area, I came across a gentleman called John Gunnison, and he had very strong opinions Ooh. about the Mormons okay. and the Latter-day Saints, and he wrote a book about them. And when I researched Gunnison a little Gunnison a little further, he was a victim of a massacre that happened in the Utah Territory. You don't say. That yes, seems, I do. That seems to be the subject of this entire episode. <laughs> so please, Jennifer, tell me about the Gunnison Massacre. Oh my gosh. The Gunnison Massacre has been described as a result of the significant clash of cultures that was happening in the area at the time. Not only Native and white cultures, but also Mormon and the U.S. government. And then bring in the whole railroad question all of these different what forces what is the tell me about the railroad question what does that mean meaning the united states government was looking to establish a transcontinental railroad that would run from one side of the country all the way to the other to the pacific ocean from the atlantic to the pacific and so the question was where is it going to go through which communities will it go and which won't it go, right? And right. so that was like really the whole purpose of Gunnison's party who was there in 1853. See, 
Captain John Gunnison was the leader of a surveying expedition for the Central Pacific Railroad. And on the morning of October 26, 1853, he and some of his men left camp to explore a part of the Utah Territory. Okay. Can I just tell you, he wasn't alone. He was with um, a, a topographer, an artist, a botanist. He was with a Mormon guide, some privates, and a camp roustabout. I want to be the camp roustabout. Jill, that sounds like the funnest job ever. What? I, I'm putting in my application. What do you... <laughs> I had to what look is it a up. camp roustabout? I had to look it up. A roustabout is a, quote, unskilled casual laborer. That's so me. <laughs> that is so me. Can like, you see uh, that? I'll get it later. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. So tell me what happened. Anyway, so he had a group with him. So while they were out surveying, they were ambushed and attacked. Oh, my God. And John Gunnison what, had been slain with seven o- others in his group, but four of them did escape. That is tragic. It is. Terribly tragic. And what's interesting about this is that one Utah historical text from 1928 notes that there is a absence of details to this story and what actually happened. This narrative was based almost exclusively on information gathered by pioneers of the county, several of whom were aided in burying the dead, like after the fact. So it's just okay. interesting that four people were there, escaped, were essentially eyewitnesses, and yet were missing a lot of the details. And the people who gave the information were people who came and buried the dead after the fact. Isn't that interesting? That is very interesting. A little suspect, I would, I'm, I'm thinking, to be honest. Well, one wonders why they didn't have more information if there were four survivors. Exactly. Like four survivors, that's a lot. So I want to unveil our voiceless, I believe, is Gunnison. Oh, you're coming out a little early with that information. Well, I want you to tell us a little bit about Gunnison because, like I said, he wrote a book about the Mormons, but he was also a surveyor. So tell me a little bit about who he was and how he got to the Utah Territory. Okay. So Gunnison was born in 1812 in New Hampshire of humble means. He graduated from West Point in 1837, and he was second in his class. That's impressive. Mm -hmm. So he was a military Mm -hmm. man. Gunnison was married to Martha and um, Jill. Guess where they lived? Where? The two of them lived together in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Shut your mouth. That's a hop, skip, and a jump away from me. It is. And he explored a lot of the area around the Great Lakes. That's crazy talk. He surveyed the border between Wisconsin and Michigan, and he eventually bought the southeast quarter section of Walker Township in Kent County. That is literally insane. I know exactly where that is. Really? Yeah, exactly. Interesting. That area there is known as Gunnison Swamp. That's giving me goosebumps. I did not realize. Yeah, he, apparently he lived right near you. Crazy. So Gunnison was an accomplished guy, clearly, and he was charged with finding a railroad route across the Rocky Mountains. No small feat. Okay. Now, remember how I I just told you about the massacre that happened while he was in charge? Yeah. History would name the native Paiute people as the murderers of Gunnison and his men. Why? I think in my mind, I can see that the natives would be killing them because, well, they're on their land. Exactly. It, you know what I mean? Right. So. I'm sure the Paiutes did not want white men in the area. That culture clash was already established, right? And he could have just been, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The end. <laughs> and that's our story, folks. The Colorado Encyclopedia.org reports that a party of Paiute Indians surrounded and attacked Gunnison and the expedition in their camp. Of course, we know that Gunnison and seven others were killed. The four survivors alerted another survey party, and they reached the site two days later and found the camp ransacked and the dead scattered by animals. Oh, yeah. Geez. So was this a big deal, or did were these types of massacres happening all over the area? Actually, this was big news. 
This was the worst such disaster suffered by any expedition in 40 years of exploration of the West. Yeah. See, there were again. sensational headlines across the United States about this event. Mm. And one of the results, one of the results, by the way, was that the route that he was exploring for the, the Central Railroad um, would change and move farther north to avoid this area of the Utah Territory. They were looking at Wyoming instead. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. This is a huge deal. It is. And it seems like, although history says we have a very large lack of information, it seems like the, the indigenous people of the area took these people out. Why are we talking about this? Well, because... Some sources note that the Mormons might have been responsible for the murder. What? Okay. We went from burning down a newspaper <laughs> to literally ambushing and murdering a surveying party. That's a huge leap. Who's saying this and why? It is a huge leap. Who knew the Mormons had it in them? Oh, my gosh. Well, you have to remember that the Mormons and the United States government weren't really getting along too well. Why is that? Brigham Young's the governor of the area. Well, remember how I told you they they moved to Utah before that territory was part of the United States? Right. Well, after the Mexican-American War in 1848... It was then under the jurisdiction of the United States. And in 1851, like we said, they made Brigham Young the governor of Utah. But he kind of ruled it like a theocracy. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. Kind of. That's messed up because one of the founding principles of our democracy is the separation of church and state. And when you say theocracy, that means that the laws of whatever church take precedent over the laws of the federal government. That is absolutely right. And I do have to say up front that historians don't agree on whether or not it's proper to call this establishment, Brigham Young's establishment, a quote unquote theocracy. But like, it's just the fact that they're talking about it, I think means, you know, means something. Do you know what I mean? Because if it clearly yeah. wasn't, then it wouldn't even be, it wouldn't even be up for debate. I think some of them want to call it like a theo democracy. But the point is Brigham Young was in charge and he was also the head of the church as well as the head of the uh, political community. So let me get this straight. People accuse the Mormons of having some involvement in this massacre because the United States and specifically the church and Brigham Young were were um, in a contentious relationship. But they would were. he kill? Would he literally kill like seven people in a horrible way and frame the natives because he just didn't like the United States putting their nose in Utah's business? OK, well, you mentioned that Gunnison wrote a book about the Mormons. I did. Okay, well. I hear it's a bestseller. Like, people were into it. Gunnison wrote about the zealous nature of the Mormons and how they had a mission to restore the true and divine Christian virtues and to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they were zealous in this, right? But mm -hmm. their overzealousness, he would say, would be the cause the cause of their own religious persecution, right? So basically he said, look, Mormons, you're bringing it on yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You are being way over the top and you're making yourselves targets, right? So that was one part of Gunnison's book. Another part was that he believed that it was other people persecuting the Mormons that strengthened that religious zeal, so mm -hmm. the other point is like, hey, everybody, lay off the Mormons. Stop persecuting them because you're making the problem worse. The more you persecute them, the stronger and more united they will be. However, if you stop and let them be, they will implode because they will splinter off into more moderate beliefs and practices given time, right? And so that was kind of the overarching message of his book. And to be honest with you, from the research, his book was looked at as a very um, respectful and insightful 
understanding of the Latter-day Saints, Mm. Uh, not only at the time, but like history looks back at his writings as like, oh, that's fair. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. how did the Mormons take it? Uh, Well, uh, they didn't like it. And I think there's some evidence that people were trying to warn Gunnison, like before he even got to like the Utah Territory, they were like trying to warn him, hey, you know, Mormons are pissed off right now at you. You know that book, bro? (laughs) They read it. Not a fan. Mormons are pissed. (laughs) So why would Gunnison write a book about the Mormons? What did, how did he have that kind of intimate look into who they were as a people? And why did he write, feel the need to write the book about it? My understanding is that while Gunnison was off surveying different parts of the United States, he had interactions with Mormons and was curious enough and knowledgeable enough to put together this book. And he, um, yeah, just kind of describing, you know, who they are and, you know, from a sociological perspective, his opinions on what would happen and and how other non-Mormon groups should interact with them. Got it. So at the time when he was appointed to survey the railroad in the Rockies, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he goes, gets massacred, right? Yes, Yes. he gets murdered with his Is that the basic the the basis for the for the understanding that the Mormons may be involved just because of this book? Well, here's what came out after his death. His widow, Martha, maintained that Gunnison's own letters to her indicate that he was in fear for his life because of the Mormons. He was afraid that he would be harmed by Mormons. So he was like, my dear beloved Martha, the Mormons today look very pissed at me. They're giving me side eye. (laughs) She actually had letters that her husband wrote saying the Mormons were the directors of my husband's murder. Okay. What did she do with this information? She wrote to the Supreme Court of the Territory of Utah, and she received confirmation from the court that there were witness accounts documented in several trials after the murders, and they cited numerous white attackers dressed up like Native people during the massacre. Shut up. I knew it. They always blame the natives because it's like such a simple, you know, like the indigenous people were stealing from. They were mad and they killed a bunch of white people. It's it's such a clean story that we see it time and time and again that people are gaslighting with that narrative. It makes me so angry. So when she took it, basically, when she took it to the authorities, they're like, yeah, we heard that, too. Let's investigate. Right. So how did they investigate? So a Lieutenant Colonel Edward Steptoe was sent by the War Department. You love that name. Steptoe is a great name. Love it. Um, Anyway, so Steptoe comes in. He's from the War Department of the United States, okay? So now the, the feds are involved. And Steptoe found that there was no Mormon involvement at all. Really? Uh huh. Well, a couple things. He seems to have been pretty chummy with the Mormons, I gotta say. Okay. Because when he arrived and he needed a bodyguard, he went to the Mormons and employed like the most notorious, biggest, baddest bodyguard guy that that they had. Like, dude, if you're going to investigate a people for a a serious crime, like the crime of the century, you don't go to them and be like, hey, y'all, do you guys got a bodyguard to protect me from you? Like that doesn't happen. You don't use their security. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, in my mind, you have the words of Gunnison himself, and then you have Steptoe on the other side. Gunnison saying, I'm in danger from the Mormons, and then Steptoe saying, no, it wasn't the Mormons at all. It was the Native peoples. So two different possible culprits. But, I mean, honestly, yes, the man wrote a book, but would you slaughter him and seven other people or six other people? Yeah, that doesn't really seem likely, right? Right. Well, I, I certainly hope not. That the Mormons would, like, murder him because they, you know, he hurt their feelings in his book. Right. Is there anything else? Well, remember why he was there. And remember what I said about the railroad. Because the railroad represents a threat in some ways to some Mormons. Now, 
not all Mormons were the same. There were conflicts within the group. Sure. As, ironically, Gunnison points out in his book. Exactly. Exactly right. But overall, the Mormons were trying to build a Zion, a utopian society that was based on their values and beliefs, right? And Mm -hmm. this depended on a level of isolation from corruptible forces outside of the church, right? Okay. And so the idea of a railroad coming through the area in 1853, while this community was just starting to be established, would be to some a threat. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But what we do know is that in 1853, Jill, that same year, Brigham Young actually was asking Congress for a railroad to be built. Okay. From Salt Lake City to the Pacific Ocean. Okay. So at at least know that Brigham Young was for having a railroad there. But Mm -hmm. sources, historical sources, hint at the disagreements. And one of the, the concerns of some of the Mormons was that cheaper goods brought from the east would hurt the self-sufficient economy that they were trying to build there right Mm. because we have these people that are just starting think about it they're in a desert they have to like irrigate they have to plant they have to farm this is a big deal why are you going to do all that why are you going to create your own farm when a railroad can bring you cheap grain from the east why would you bother exactly i'm for the railroad too (laughs) The other problem was mining. How so? I know. It seems so weird, doesn't it? Like mining is like this big controversial thing. Well, Mm -hmm. Brigham Young himself preached about the evils of mining. What? I know, right? It's a very strange thing to be like premarital sex and no (laughs) mining. Like why? What are you saying? Remember, it's the year 1853. And the gold rush mm-hmm. is happening in California. And Brigham Young and the Mormons and the rest of the, the world are seeing these population explosions overnight in places where minerals like gold, silver are found. And people are rushing there. All kinds of people are rushing there. And what are they doing? They're businesses, saloons, brothels, lawlessness, violence, prostitution, gambling. All of these things are popping up. So the Mormons were worried that the railroad would be kind of a proponent of that whole mining craze that was happening at the time. And so he was all like, no, the Mormons don't mine. We're we're not mining because he was afraid someone's going to find something. And then he's not going to be able to control the influx of non-Mormons to the area. So these were two really, really big, big reasons why some people were anti-railroad at the time. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm. You said before the result of the Gunnison Massacre um, led to a different route for the railroad. Were there any other unseen consequences? Yes. And I just want to clarify that the route that they were surveying was, uh, for the time, abandoned, But there would eventually be a railroad that does go right through Salt Lake City with the help of the Mormons. This was like 15 years later. So I just want to make that clear that they do get the railroad. The railroad will actually be built by Mormons, right? And Mm -hmm. so the the whole labor force would be very carefully controlled. But they would get a railroad later on. Um, Um, But back in 1853, another outcome of the massacre was that remember that strain between Brigham Young and the United States Brigham Young being kind of a theocrat Mm -hmm. and the United States being like you can't be a theocrat in the United (laughs) States yeah Uh I remember that whole thing yeah so um this incident contributed to these tensions and actually helped leading them to something called the Utah War Never in my life have I ever heard of the Utah War. No kidding, neither what have was I. It? Well, it was an incident where President Buchanan sent U.S. troops to Utah in order to stop a reported Mormon, quote unquote, insurrection. Holy shit. Yeah. There was like a Mormon militia versus like the federal troops for That's real. Insane. I know. That is too deep and too much to get into. Maybe a bonus episode. Maybe a bonus. I mean, this is just crazy. That is craziness. I did not know that there was an insurrection in the United States by the Mormons. No kidding. That's mind-blowing. Me either. So 
Gunnison. Yes. Amazing man. Amazing man. Such a legacy. Uh, such a good time to have the story having Memorial Day just passed because he really gave his life for this country. Can you tell me some of the things that are a part of his legacy? There are so many things named after Gunnison. Gunnison Avenue in Grand Rapids, the city of Gunnison in Utah, a city called Gunnison in Colorado, Gunnison River, Gunnison National Park, the Gunnison Grouse. He has a bird named after him. Gunnison County, Colorado, National Forest, Gunnison Reservoir, Gunnison Island in Salt Lake, Gunnison Lake in Goshen, New Hampshire. He has a gun named after him, a beach named after him, and even a prairie dog. Oh, that's adorable. Adorable. Yes. So this guy was, he was a big deal. That is huge. Did they find any of his remains at all after the massacre? Only a few identified remains of Captain Gunnison are in an unmarked grave in Fillmore, Utah. Mm -hmm. And a modern highway now traverses uh, some of the old trails that he surveyed. Well, he really does sound like a remarkable man. He sounds very Indiana Jones, right? That's hot. That is hot. Like he just went around traveling, surveying stuff during a time when they're like, you don't know where you're going. Exactly. No, you're absolutely right. To think of a surveyor today does like it doesn't seem like sexy at all. But you're right. He was like the Indiana Jones of his time. He would have had to have been brave and courageous to map out the unknown. It's crazy. So why are we giving him a voice? Like he's like this this amazing American and I love him and he has a prairie dog name after him, but why are we giving him a voice? I think Jill, you have been championing for Gunnison for like a year. It's true. I did not want to do the story because I'm afraid of powerful groups like the Mormons who could crush me. But that's fair. But he has been like on you for a year to tell this story. Has he not? He really has because like psychically, psychically. Mm-hmm. psychically, it is incredibly obvious that the Mormons had something to do with this. I'm not saying Brigham Young himself, but I am saying that the Mormons for sure killed these people psychically. I, and I know you feel that way. And I think that we do have some some evidence that the Mormons, many didn't like Gunnison. They didn't like what he said. They didn't like his messages. And some of them didn't like the railroad. didn't like the idea of the railroad coming in in 1853. But Jennifer... Congress confirmed to Mrs. Gunnison that had letters. Like right. he wrote out the letters like, look, honey, babe, these people want me dead. Right. And she gave them to Congress and they're like, yep, Mrs. Gunnison, we know. Not only that, but there's also evidence that the Mormons were not above violence. Shut your mouth. So this isn't the first time? No, it's not the first time. President Polk in 1851 uh, sent some U.S. officials into the territory, and the Mormons didn't want them there. And the four appointees fled the territory for fear of their personal safety. Oh, my God. So, okay. See, this was a thing. This was a thing. This was a thing. So it wasn't that they were burning down the newspaper, which really is bad enough because, again, in America, we have the freedom of press anyway. But now they're like scaring off federal officials. Gunnison must have had some big old kahunas to be like, even though these people are angry and and, and threatening president's men, I'm going to go there and Mm -hmm. survey this land for the railroad. Right. So I I guess it would be a risk if you are non-Mormon to like infiltrate the the community in some ways, I guess. Especially if they're already pissed at you. Right. Right. Exactly. Gunnison. Well, wow. Amazing story. And he was totally killed by the Mormons. (laughs) Let's debrief. (laughs) Let's talk about our hits and talk about how psychic we are. (laughs) Gosh, the idea of the Mormons being in a story kept coming to us and we couldn't and shake it. And you kept saying, no, I know, no, I know. No. <laughs> but I had, I guess we had to do it. We make a contract with spirit. Our deal is you give us a story that's verifiable, unknown to us via our psychic impressions so we can give voice to the voiceless. That's our contract. Right. And so we are, so here we are talking about the Mormons. But what do you we think? We love you, Mormons. <laughs> you have a wonderful mall, honestly. They have great a mall. great mall. Great mall. Yeah. A river running through the mall, for real. With actual fish. Yeah. You can go fishing in the mall. It's nuts. 
Um, tell me about things that are not what they seem to be. What do you think that means? There are so many things in this story that could be that, right? Mm-hmm. It could be the people dressing up as mm-hmm. Paiute natives could and be. attacking Gunnison. It could, could be. be the the sense of safety Gunnison felt originally to come into the area and then finding out like, oh, these people want me dead. Mm-hmm. There are so many things that that can be. Mm-hmm. What do you think it is? I think it also might be what history says and what really happened. Ooh, that's deep. Mm. That's deep. I like the idea of the changing community. There is a lot of changes going on in that area. Oh, my gosh. And if you just think about the history of Mormonism, how like that was kind of their deal for a long time. You know, they move to a community and then they move again and then they move to a community and then they move again. Mm, That's a great, great point. I mean, do we even have to go over feeling ambushed, under attack, felt unwelcome? Just like probably like John Gunnison felt. Mm-hmm. We're going to check those boxes off. Land grab? Oh, my God. For sure. Who would be land grabbing? The Mormons, the Mormons. came in the area right. and they scooped up that land. They're like, this is ours now. Right. I mean, it's it wasn't just the Mormons, obviously. I mean, pretty much every white person who came to the continent was doing the same thing. But in this context... The Mormons. Yeah. The railroad connection is a major theme through this story. Oh, and my is gosh. obvious at this point that, you know, the, the threat of the railroad and then Gunnison's role for the railroad as a surveyor all coming together and then mining. Thou shall not mime. <laughs> O-M-G. Mine. Who knew? Say it again. Mine. Do you, you mean mime? <laughs> I thought you said mime. <laughs> Thou shall not no. mime. <laughs> I'm in a box. I'm in a box. I'm pulling a rope. Pulling a rope. I can see that very seductive, that rope pulling. The Mormons have crazy rules. But we love you and you're great people. Please don't be mad at us. Step for wives. Conformity. Yep. I also think about the idea of like the Mormons having a party, but it's by invitation only. You know what I mean? Uh, like you can come and join our community, <laughs> but only if you're a, you know, a convert. We don't want anyone coming in here and just doing their own thing. Right? Mm, that idea of it. like conformity. You conform to the culture, the values of the society. Yeah. Mhm. Love that. And Jill, that was deep. <laughs> Thank you. And the whole I love that the history, the literal written history of Tule County led you to Gunnison. OMG. The first resource I looked at was a history of Tule County. And in that book, a snippet about John Gunnison, he stood out and it, it was almost like I was using binoculars mm-hmm. and I was focusing in on Gunnison. And then to find out later, he had been killed with others near where we were driving. Yeah. That was like, Bing, bang, bong. This is our story. And then the controversy of who killed these people. I was like, we got ourselves a voice list. So I think in conclusion, here we are yet again, confronted with a story that challenges how we think of American history and how Mm. history is crafted by the record keepers or the narrative writers. And... John Gunnison literally, right, in his own record said, these people are going to kill me. If something bad happens to me, it is these people. And yet history kind of just brushed it off as, oh, that was a rumor. It was the natives who were responsible for the massacre. So Jill Gunnison, sum it up for us. He was an American hero who did so much for this country. He was sent out west to, to survey the Utah Territory. He was fearful for his life, but yet he still accepted that mission. And ultimately, he died because of it. And his concerns were ignored, even though the Mormons had a history of using fear tactics. Poor Gunnison. Thank you, Gunnison, for coming to us. I hope that we gave you a voice. And you sound hot. He does. Tell the people where they can find us. Well, check out our website, commonmystics.net. Look us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Common Mystics Pod. You can listen in wherever you're hearing your favorite podcast. But if you are listening in on Apple, please leave us a positive review so other people can find us. 
we love your reviews. They give me life. They Thank do. you so much for leaving them. They keep us going. Thank you and good night. Thanks. Good night. Good night.